Welcome to Friday. Now, this is always one of my favorite days because I get to share something with, with you all. But this is a particularly good uh, Friday because not too long ago, I went to my mailbox, and in my mailbox were three stories. Now, I know some of you all are fans of Toby. And anyway, Toby's creator, Richard Cope, uh, happened to send me three new adventures. And without any further ado, I'm going to share with you the treasures that I found in my mailbox. Now, just in case there's anybody in the world who doesn't know who Toby is, he is a rather cantankerous dog, uh, and uh, he's really quite a, a popular fella. I mean, he's from Bean County up in yonder in Tennessee. So I'm going to tell you what just happened to Toby. And this time, it's Toby and the Bold Weevil Ball. There sure is something to be said about getting all dressed up in fancy pants clothes and strutting around like peacocks. Now, most of the time, the good folks of Bean County don't go in much for such highfalutin fashion, except for once a year. Everybody shows up, wears their finest to the Bean County Bowl Weevil Ball. Now, the ball is always held at the uh, Hoochahatchee Country Club and Fish Camp, located right on the beautiful shores of Lake Hoochahatchee. Not traditionally. It has always been the venue of choice for weddings, graduations, and other various notable gala events. Wow, most of the fine ladies in the county had their coming out cotillions here, ranging from, from sweet 16 on up. Why, heck, you know Miss Abigail Anderson? Huh, she even come out twice. Now, the first uh, time uh, when she was a dainty young debutante, and later, after she got divorced from that, that dreadful Harold Hamilton. Well, now that's when she went out and got re-debutanted with the very fine William Westerfield when they was both in their 80s. Oh, everybody was there. Now, this year, it being such a high-profile social event, it was decided to have the best food around, catered by the Dawson family chuck wagon grill and ribs. Now, it was run by two sisters, Darlene and Charlene, with the help of their cousins, Raylene and you know, Nadine. They set up out in the parking lot by the big open pit fire ring and metal grate where they cooked up every kind of ribs that you could want. Oh, they had ribs and slaw, ribs and, and beans, ribs and fried pickles, ribs and okra, all served with hot buttered cornbread, plus many other fine mouth-watering delicacies, a la carte style. Why, nearby, they had some real nice picnic benches with white tablecloths set up under big striped umbrella for ambience. Now, inside the main ballroom, the Garden Society had donated every kind of flower and, and bouquets you could imagine, what to make it look real nice and, oh, and smell good, too. They was folding chairs all around what people could rest up on in between the, the dances. Plus, there was even a few saved just in case, you know, oh, for, for the wallflower types. Now, all the ladies wore their finest go-to-church-on-Sunday dresses, real prim and proper-like. Some even wore little white gloves and pearl necklaces. 
now the men mostly just wore clean shirts and wide checkered neckties what they got for Christmas or Father's Day. Everything was going real fine with folks mingling and gossiping before the ballroom festivities began, you know, telling each other, oh, how nice it was. Now just then, Jasper Johnson pulled up out front with Toby. Now, Jasper got out of the truck, put a clean hanky in his pocket, combed back his hair. Then he told Toby, sit still and not to cause no commotion. As he walked inside, Alvin Eastman was making an announcement. He thanked everybody for coming out to support the Bold Weevil Society, then proclaimed the first dance of the night was going to be a Sadie Hawkins choice. Then the musical magic of Floyd and Earl started playing a Tennessee waltz. <gasps> and soon everybody was swooning. Outside, Charlene had just cleaned off some picnic plates and was going to throw the scraps and the trash around back. When she got there, <gasps> she noticed the cans was all knocked over, and one of them looked like it was moving. Then she saw two eyes peek out, followed by a big snout. Oh, right off, she knew what it was. It was Ghost Belly Billy, the Razorback Hog, which seemed like it chased after everybody in the whole county one time or another. Now, never mind, no mind if it was true or not. Charlene let out a holler at the top of her lungs. Well, nobody heard her call, because by then everybody was inside singing and clogging to rock a top so loud the rafters was shaking. Toby jumped out of the truck window and come running real fast, though. That old hog just stood there, snorting, with his bristle hair standing straight up and, and fire in his eyes. That's when the red leg rooster and Toby come out. He commenced to snarling and barking, and carrying on so bad that old ghost belly turned tail, took off running for the hills. Charlene ran inside the ballroom screaming, It's him! It's him! Meanwhile, Claude Perkins, what was sweet-talking Miss Gladys Jean Lawson about her new hairstyle, heard all the commotion, went out back to see what it was. And the only thing he saw was the trash cans turned over with scraps lying all over, everywhere. Oh, then he saw Toby put two and two together, fetched a broom from the back porch what was used for sweeping up sawdust from the dance floor, chased after Toby. Oh, but he never could catch him. Finally, he went back inside, marched right up to Jasper Johnson, who was sitting in one of the wallflower chairs, and he read him the riot act. Now, Sheriff Barlow, who was present in an unofficial capacity as chaperone for the event, escorted Jasper outside and told him and Toby to leave immediately. Jasper called for Toby, only to see that well, he was in the truck already, but somehow didn't look just right. You know, he looked kind of like an astronaut. Seems like after getting chased by the sawdust broom, he went back to the trash cans, rooting around for anything he could find. Ooh, that's when he saw big old plastic cheese ball appetizer jar and, and, and trying to, to reach the bottom. He got his head stuck inside. Oh, he looked plum pitiful. Now, despite his waning popularity, one of the nice ladies with the white gloves asked her date 
who happened to be from the Farm Bureau, see if he could help Toby. They made a plan for Jasper to hold Toby by the neck while the other man pulled a jar off of his head. Whole time, Floyd and the Earl never stopped playing their musical interlude and numerous special requests. Overall, some reports to the contrary. Most folks said, Ah, oh, it was the best bowl weevil ball ever. Now later that night, back, back home in Coggins County, Jasper tried to console poor Toby. You know, except for getting your head stuck, I was real proud of you, boy. You done good. But now, that being said, maybe it was all for the best, after all. Well, now I think I'm going, I'm fixing to tell you another story. This is about <clears throat> Toby and the pie contest. Just like there's two kinds of people, them that likes dogs and other ones what would, you know, like, likes cats. There's people what like cake and what like pie. Well, folks in Bean County, Tennessee, <clears throat> don't have to stay up late at night and lose sleep wondering what side of the fence they was on because they knew it, it was almost universal. That, that is to say, uh, unanimous, like, oh, sure, there was some with like cake, no matter what kind or what flavor, or them that was that only ate it to be polite, you know, if it was served on Sunday after church, but, oh, they was, you know, just outliers, mostly. All the real born and bred folks from Bean County was pure pie people, plain and simple. Their grannies and great grannies grew up baking pies fresh from the oven, leaving them to cool off on the windowsill. And they weren't no two ways about it. That was that. Pie. They was always handcrafted, works of art, uh, made with love from scratch. Oh, it smelled so good. And it tasted even better. It was serious business by Jingo. Every family had their favorite pie and secret recipe that them old grannies guarded tighter than a tick. So when it came time for the big cook-off, they was ready. Now, most years, the event was always held in Piney Flat at the Pie Palace on property leased from Old Man Laidlaw. Now this year, though everybody raised a ruckus over what most people referred to as the recent Independent Day accident, huh, seems last year's 4th of July would have been fine, except for Old man Laidlaw was in charge of setting off the fireworks to cap off the festivities that night. Well, before it even got close to dark, huh? even dusky, old man Laidlaw got so double dog drunk he said he couldn't he couldn't wait no more to start the show. It was still clear as day about six o'clock when he launched them suckers off. Oh, they was an impressive sight, all right. Uh, only not as good as nighttime. Everybody knows fireworks need that dark sky if they're going to be best. It was mostly disappointing for the young uns what had never seen daylight fireworks before. Heaps of them started crying. Right off, parents got upset and everybody else was madder than a wet hen. They started calling old man Laidlaw Lame Law and Laidlow. 
and various other unpleasantries. So on account of that, this year's pie cook-off got moved to the fairgrounds over in uh, Sumter instead. Now, <clears throat> most folks would say it's only pies, except when it comes to cook-off time. There's, there's very definite rules to abide. First off, went without saying, no store-bought pies was allowed. Next, all pies was divided into three basic columns, such as chiffon, fruit, and berry. Then, there was every kind of pie which you could never even imagine. Cherry, peach, oh, rhubarb, blueberry, pecan, coconut cream, Lemon meringue, raisin and apple. There was even a new pie what Granny Carter whipped up and called some kind of blumbleberry. Um, oh, Judges put it in a special column by itself as a test pie. Now, the most winningest ladies, what won most of every year, was called Three Aces. It was derived from their names. Every single one of them started and ended with H's. But mostly, you know, it sounded kind of like Aces. Helen, Honeycutt, Hester, Hollander, Hildegard, Howell. Now, their trademark was to bake all their initials into their pie crust like a little, little bit of brandy iron. All them other ladies what made pies with no crust was considered entered from the mystery chefs. Every year, there was downright all-out fierce competition between the three aces and the mystery chefs for bragging rights. Once, all the ladies was done sniping and catawalling to each other about how good their pie was, the judging could start. Now, this year, Grand Pie Marshal Wendell Worthington was considered to be impartial, seeing as how he was from Coggins County. Now, regardless of who won, custom was... Them pies was auctioned off for good cause. You know, like to the Bean County Bowl Weevil Ball, oh, it was always real popular. All the rest of them was left save for the young'uns pie-eating contests in the 12 and under column. Now, Wendell had all them pies lined up on a real long table, like uh, all Yawkey b -b buffet getting ready to happen. Senator August P. Collinwood was also on hand so he could confer the results and present a big blue ribbon for best pie by column and best pie overall to his lucky constituents. Now, even though he was never invited and strongly discouraged from attending social events of this magnitude, Jasper Johnson pulled up in his truck and got out with Toby. Now Jasper walked toward the Pie Palace while Toby took off into a cow pasture. Oh, everything, <clears throat> everything was going good. All the pies was tasted in the first column, and they were starting to evaluate and discuss the merits of the test pie. That is when, out of nowhere, Toby come running. Seems like he had been e eating a few pies on his own. Cow pies. But them granny pies just smells too good for him to ignore. He jumped up on the table with his front legs and commenced to uh, gobble on the test pie, knocked over a couple of big old pitchers of sweet tea and coffee, 
They took the inhalants, some of their mystery pies. People got out and started running. Then Toby lit out with a big burp, shook himself real hard with what parts of cow pies he'd been rolling in, went in flying every which way. He seemed pretty proud of himself. He jumped back up and ate two more pies of the aces. About that time, Jasper Johnson come running back and yelling, Toby, Toby, quit! Toby, not a Toby, stop! Toby just looked at him with his one good eye, kept on eating. It was a fiasco. By the time it was all over, the cook-off was declared, conceded by all parties due to um, irregularities. Next day, there was a special editorial section of the Valley Times what called out why Sheriff Barlow was not present to restrain such unruly behavior. It said that if he was doing his job, what for the voters elected him, he would declare Toby public enemy number one. Furthermore, it suggested roadblocks and barricades he manned to keep this terror out of Bean County. Short of that, perhaps, aerial patrols was maybe gonna be necessary. Jasper Johnson sat on his front porch over in Coggins County, reading the paper. Toby lay at his feet, Bad news, boy, he said to Toby. Looks like from now on till things settle down a bit, we're going to have to eat uh, cake. Well, now that's two stories from Toby, and I said I was going to do three. Well, I ain't no, no tell of tall tales. I'm going to save the last one. And I just made up my mind while I was reading to y'all. I'm going to read this last one, which is called Toby and the Christmas Pageant in a show right before Christmas. But meanwhile, I probably got maybe five minutes or more left. I ain't going to waste no time. I happen, I happen to have a real fine look in front of me that I got downstairs at Story and Song whilst I was working on rehearsing for this, this here show I just did. It's called Dog Poems. And it's edited by Christopher Waite and Leonora Craig Cohen. It's a very tiny book, but it's got some masterful dog poems in it. And what I'm going to read to you now, and I'll try to get back to my normal voice, except every time I visit Bean County, Tennessee, I find it hard to come back to Fernandina. I mean, they talk normal Fernandina. I don't talk. I talk like Bean County. It's the way I talk when I talk like I want to talk. But I'll try to make up and do it right for y'all. One Lawrence Ferlinghetti, how's that for a switch, wrote a poem. Dog. The dog trots freely in the street and sees reality. And the things he sees are bigger than himself. And the things he sees are his reality. Drunks in doorways. Moons on trees, the dog trots freely through the street, and the things he sees are smaller than himself. Fish on newsprint, ants in holes, chickens in Chinatown windows, their heads a block away. The dog trots freely in the street, and the things he smells smell something like himself. The dog trots freely in the street, past pub puddles and babies, cats and cigars, pool rooms and policemen. He doesn't hate cops. 
He merely has no use for them. And he goes past them and past the dead cows hung up whole in front of the San Francisco meat market. He would rather eat a tender cow than a tough policeman. Though either might do as he goes past the Romeo Ravioli factory and past Coit's Tower and past Congressman Doyle. Oh, he's afraid of Coit's Tower, but he's not afraid of Congressman Doyle. Although what he hears is very discouraging, very depressing, very absurd to a sad young dog like himself. To be a serious dog like himself. But he has his own free world to live in, his own fleas to eat. He will not be muzzled. Congressman Doyle is just another fire hydrant to him. The dog trots freely in the street and has his own dog's life to live, and to think about, and to reflect upon, touching and tasting and testing everything, investigating everything, without benefit of perjury, a real realist with a real tale to tell, and a real tale to tell it with, a real Live, barking, democratic dog engaged in real, free enterprise with something to say about ontology, something to say about reality, and how to see it, and how to hear it, with his head cocked sideways at street corners as if he was just about to have his picture taken for Victor Records, listening for his master's voice and looking like a living question mark into the great gramophone of puzzling existence with its wondrous hollow horn which always seems just about to spout forth some victorious answer to everything. That's one poem of many in this tiny but mighty little book at Story and Song called, strangely enough, Dog Poems. But I have it on good authority that Toby would approve of my additional selection for today. And now don't forget, I am going to read you about Toby and the Christmas pageant but I sure enough didn't want to rush this thing and not give it its full measure. So I'm going to wait until closer to Christmas time before I share this one with you. Now, y'all have a good weekend. And if y'all happen to be in Bean County and you pass by, by Toby, I want you should pat him on the head, provided his head ain't in some big jaw of, of, of cheese ball stuff, and give him a good old chuck behind his ears because... He likes friendly people, and I know that's what you are. So I'll see you next Friday. Actually, I'm going to come with a friend of mine next Friday. And as a matter of fact, she's Gillian, Gillian Johnson, and she's going to tell you about an English lady, some Virginia Wolf. Hmm. You two need to hear more about her. Till then, y'all have a spectacular weekend.